Hello, everyone. Welcome to module two of ML Foundations, session two, getting started with feature engineering. Our speaker today is Shimir Davis. Uh, so if you have any comments or questions, please uh, use the chat um, or the Q&A box. Uh, with that said, I will hand it over to our speaker. Enjoy the session. Thanks so much, Franklin. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the second session in module two. So today we're going to be doing um, a little uh, a little bit of a dive into a couple of techniques that are supported by H2O products. So um, if you're interested in learning how to, you know, do a couple of techniques, one maybe in H2O3, and then maybe understanding how some automated uh, feature engineering is done, then this session is for you. So I'm going to go over a few things. And as Franklin mentioned, if you have questions, I'll try to answer them during the um, as I can during the uh, the session. If not, then we can save questions if there's time at the end. And, you know, I encourage you to use the discussion forum um, to ask additional questions uh, if you have some that arise after the session today. All right, so what we're going to do today is um, we're going to uh, do a little bit of a review of um, some of the feature engineering techniques that maybe if you attended Tuesday's session, which was amazing, um, it, uh, we'll talk about some of those. And, um, and then, you know, if you didn't attend that session, I do encourage you to go back and, and watch the replay um, because you'll get to hear from one of the experts' uh, mouths um, the importance of some of these feature engineering techniques. And then I'm going to introduce you to a very specific technique using H2O3 called target encoding. And then I'll do, um, which includes a demo of H2O3. And then um, we'll do um, a, a little bit of a discussion of automated feature engineering and driverless AI. And I'll do a demo of that as well. And then we'll talk about next steps. All right, so again, we're here in the second session um, of module two. Um, this will be the last session for feature engineering. Um, and I wanted to note that, you know, this is a, a the machine learning foundations course. We won't be able to kind of address all of the feature engineering techniques. We're just trying to get you started um, with, you know, get you started using machine learning if you've never had any experience. Um, so I would encourage you to come back, you know, we'll, we'll continue to offer sessions. Um, and as you start to kind of provide some feedback, we can probably um, point you in the right direction in terms of resources. But after today's session, we'll have another study group and ask me anything session this weekend. And then next week, we'll start with um, a deep dive into some machine learning techniques. Okay. Um, I wanted to take a quick moment just to talk about the quizzes and the hands-on exercises. So as part of this machine learning foundations course, you are going to have the opportunity to, you know, do some coding and, you know, interact with some of the automated uh, platforms. So um, if you don't see anything right now, I encourage you to keep coming because those exercises are definitely on the way. And as you know, we, we go through the machine learning, the deep learning, um, like the big data um, uh, modules, you will definitely have the opportunity to get some experience with, um, with some of these techniques starting today. Um, so just a note that hands-on exercises and the quizzes will be posted on the community learning site within 48 hours of a session, um, usually before, but just to, you know, set your expectations, you can expect it within two days. Um, any hands-on labs that are demoed during the session um, will be identified in that hands-on exercise. So you don't have to worry that you don't know what lab to use. Um, and then I encourage you again to use the, the discussion forum for these modules, um, especially as we start to do more of the hands-on work and leverage the study groups and the Ask Me Anything sessions as well. Okay, so what we're going to do now is just we're, we're going to, you know, do a little bit of a refresh. We're going to take a quick review of um, this data preparation for machine learning kind of workflow. So we've got various steps in our data preparation pipeline like data acquisition, data cleaning, and feature engineering. Um, and down here at the bottom, we, we, um, we've identified some tools that are useful um, in some of these areas. Uh, 
to achieve some of these steps. So today and in subsequent sessions, you'll get the opportunity to learn some techniques using the H2O suite of uh, tools like H2O3, which is our open source uh, machine learning platform, as well as driverless AI, which is our enterprise um, automated machine learning platform. Um, and then, you know, as the, the series goes on, you, you'll get a preview of some of the other products that we, uh, we are releasing, but where applicable, um, we will point out some other open source resources like Python and R libraries that might be of um, interest to you, or maybe some other Spark libraries that might be interest, of interest to you. So keep a lookout for those, uh, those links where applicable. Okay. All right, so let's, let's get back into feature engineering. So I promised that I was just gonna do a quick review so we could get to the demo section of uh, this session. So, you know, feature engineering is really important. It's an, it's an important technique when we talk about how to improve machine learning model performance. And so feature engineering is um, simply, you know, transforming the original features into something that is new and could be more predictive for that model. And so a lot of, you know, advanced data science, data scientists use feature engineering to improve their accuracy. That was evident uh, by Marios who talked about, you know, his use of feature engineering and Kaggle competitions. Um, so there are a number of different uh, like high level groups of feature engineering and I'm just going to focus on a few here today. So, you know, we've got categorical feature engineering, numeric, date and time, as well as text. And then, you know, there are also image related uh, feature engineering techniques. And so you'll hear about the text and the, the image later on in about module four. So if that's something that's of interest to you, then, you know, I would encourage you to keep coming. But in module four, we'll start to address those specialty types of um, those special uh, cases. And so depending upon your data set and your goal and the machine learning model that you use, there can be a number of feature engineering combinations to try. So um, if you think about it, feature engineering is probably one of the more time consuming aspects of machine learning because there's so you, there are lots of iterations that happen to try and get the right set of features, especially if you're doing it manually. And so that's why I want to kind of show you how to how to do an example manually and then, you know, leveraging a platform like uh, driverless AI to create hundreds of possible features very quickly. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And so uh, And so all right, sorry, I already mentioned this, but um, Basically, when you're doing feature engineering, especially manually, you're gonna do like this rinse and repeat type of cycle until you've got the best model that um, kind of fits within your trade-offs, whatever those trade-offs may be, whether that's time or, you know, an acceptable model performance score or some other, you know, business rule that might be in play. Um, so, uh, so now let's kind of recap some of those categorical feature engineering techniques that exist. This is not an exhaustive list. This is just a list of some of the more common ones that you might see. So the first I'll talk about um, is, you know, well, let me just back up and talk about the data here. So a lot of times when you're creating a data set, you might have uh, some features that are categorical in nature. And, and sometimes it, they may be numerous in your data set. Some machine learning models can support using a categorical feature um, that contains like text data like states or countries, but others might need a numerical representation of that feature. And so sometimes you have to make trade-offs. Again, like there are always trade-offs when, when you're doing machine learning modeling. So one, um, one approach to uh, taking those categorical features and turning them into a numerical one is label encoding. So um, it's you use it to convert each value in your column to a one or a zero. So we see here we've got these two cities, Pilsen and Prague. Um, so we've converted Pilsen to a zero and Prague to a one. Um, it's really simple, it's straightforward, um, but one of the things that you need to keep in mind when you use label encoding is that there could be a chance that those numeric values could be 
misinterpreted uh, by the algorithm if you're not careful. It might assume some sort of order. Um, so you just want to take that into consideration. I'll point out here that there are some links to some of the open source um, packages that address these types of uh, feature engineering. Um, so if you want to get some examples of how to do label encoding using Python or R, that's included here. So um, a step up or, you know, maybe a step to the side of using label encoding is to use one hot encoding. So that's where you're going to convert um, <clears throat> your category, each category value in into a new column and then assign a value of one or zero or true false. Um, so this, this, is the, this has the benefit of not weighting a value improperly, but it does have the downside of adding more columns to the data set. So if you see here, we go from one column to two. And so everywhere that Pilsen is a one, Prague is a zero and vice versa. Um, so this type of encoding is good for models that have um, a distance component like linear models or KNNs or neural networks. Um, it's very useful, but it can't, like I mentioned before, it can cause a number of columns to greatly expand. So if you, if you think about it, if you had a column that had um, all 50 states in the United States in it and you one hot encoded it, you would end up with 50 new columns in your data set. Um, Okay, and again, you know, I've, inc I've included some links to how to do one hot encode in, in Python and R. All right, so let's talk about, uh, we'll talk about a couple of additional categorical feature transformations. So frequency encoding, here we're going to um, encode uh, based off of the frequency distribution within the categorical column. So it preserves information. So we see here Pilsen is here three times out of the five. So it shows up 60% of the time. So here we see that Pilsen is assigned a value of 0.6, Prague is assigned a value of 0.4. So that just means like we're preserving um, the representation of the distribution in uh, in this, this field here. Um, so it's really good. Uh, it can be really good for nominal features. Um, it does uh, create meaningful natural order of features. And then, you know, those categories that have similar frequencies are treated similarly. And the last one that I'll mention, and this is the one that we're going to show today, and um, is target encoding, which can be really powerful in terms of increasing the, the performance of a model. So what this is going to do is replace a categorical level with a numeric value that represents some function of the target. So usually, sometimes it's the mean. Um, so, <clears throat> but one thing one of the, the major things to remember about target encoding is that because we're creating a function, so essentially we're doing a model of the result of an input to predict that result, we can actually introduce data leak, leakage and, you know, potentially have inaccurate or, you know, overly optimistic or overfitted models. So one way to kind of, uh, mitigate that is to use some sort of cross-validation attempt to correct for this. So it will calculate the value of each row based on other folds, so other data that it doesn't see, it, it, see, it's, it sees out, um, excuse me, other data based on other folds. So we're going to talk more about that later, and you're actually going to see an example, and you're going to do an example for your hands-on exercise. And I've included the link to the the documentation for H203 because we actually do have um, a nicely written um, function for, or excuse me, model for that. Okay, so let's move on to feature engineering for numeric features. Um, these, these are some, maybe you're familiar with them, but for numeric features, we can use interactions. So we can do things like adding two columns, subtracting, or doing some sort of multiplication and division to create some new predictors. Um, we can use binning um, to by using like a quantile or like the population of the each bin has the population of the same size or you know maybe we use a histogram all the bins have the same size um, <clears throat> we can use 
a clustering technique like k-means to create new features in the data set. And then we can also do um, use a technique like singular value decomposition or S SVD to perform dimensionality reduction. So that can be a useful feature, uh, numerical feature engineering technique. So with this, I encourage you to go back to session one from module two to hear Mario's talk more about um, the numeric feature transformations. Okay. And so um, in module four, and I've noted it here, you're actually gonna get the chance to see more of these text feature engineering techniques in action. So just to recap for you, some of the things that Mario's mentioned, um, but that you know, are, are important. And if you wanna get kind of a, a jump on um, some of the understanding, some of these feature engineering techniques, I did include some links here for you. But um, there are a couple of methods that you know, H2 will actually um, does support out of the box, um, whether that's the open source uh, product, the open source machine learning platform or the enterprise platform. So the first is um, TF-IDF, which is term frequency inverse document frequency. And that can help you determine how important a word is to a document within you know, a collection of documents. Um, we also have word embedding. So word to vec might be one of those um, one of the methods, excuse me, one of the techniques you might use. So, um, you know, it's, it's gonna take that text and then output the words as vectors. Um, and then we also have, oops, we also have target encoding. Um, and you'll see this a lot in driverless AI, um, how driverless will handle uh, text features using some sort of, you know, target encoding. Um, maybe it does like a, a term for a TF IDF with a linear model and, um, and so I included that link here. So again, in module four, you're gonna hear a lot more about that. Um, and if you wanted to play around in uh, driverless, you could uh, do that as well, just to see how driverless handles text features. Um, moving on to time-based features. Um, there are a number of valuable ways to take um, a simple date time feature and then get um, extract meaningful information from it. So from time components, you can get things like the second, the minute, the hour. Um, from dates, you can get the day, the month, the year, um, the day of the month, or, you know, the day of week, maybe the day of the year. You can create, uh, you can uh, create, like, a, figure out if the date was a holiday, and, you know, if there's some sort of seasonal information that's uh, important. And there are also, there's also this concept of lag-based features. So um, you can create lag-based features for uh, targets or, you know, targets, um, sometimes over groups. And so then that lag is then used as a new feature in your data set. So just to give you an example of like what a group would be, you know, in this data set, we've got a... Um, We've got a store department and then we've got some other attributes and then these are like our lag uh, features. So um, what we want to do is predict what's going to happen next week based off of things that happened last week and two weeks ago. So the groups, the way that we might want to group the data is maybe by, you know, trying to predict the weekly sales for store one and, um, you know, department A over and so you can group the data basically by whatever your need is, but you have to keep in, uh, keep in mind that, you know, when you have time series data, if you've got like gaps in between like your training and your test data set, then you've got to make sure that you account for that. So um, lag based features can be really helpful when you're trying to do forecasting. And so, um, and driverless does a really good job of like creating those features automatically for you. All right, so let's talk a little bit about um, the H203 target encoding. So H203 has a target encoding capability that to make creating those new um, encoded features really simple. So um, if you can imagine just kind of trying to create um, a target encoding using maybe a cross-validated method using the mean for um, of the target for different categories, it can become a little bit um, 
it can, it can become a little bit time consuming. So we've packaged up everything into a nice um, model. So we've got the H2O target encoder estimator for Python and then target encoder um, for R. So both of these are linked if you're curious um, about them. And um, so just, just so you know, like these are some of the uh, the parameters. I mean, it's pretty easy to define a target encoding estimator, um, but I'll just point out some of the key parameters I, and then you'll actually see this in action as, um, as I do this demo. The first is this blending parameter. So here's your, where you're going to define whether your target um, average should be weighted based on the count of the group. So if you've got a category where some of the, uh, the groups within that category are very small, then the simple average is going to be unreliable. So you might want to use a blended average, which is going to be a weighted average of the group's um, target value and the global target value. And so when we talk about controlling data leakage to prevent overfitting, you can use the data leakage handling um, to specify um, a different a strategy that would use some sort of um, holdout method or not. So like you've got three options. Um, so one is to not use any holdout. Uh, so the mean is calculated on all the rows of data. Um, there's a leave one out where the mean is calculated on all rows of data excluding the row. Um, and then K fold, which is the mean, is which is where the mean is calculated on out of fold data only. And this one does, and that does require a fold column. Um, and then the noise level. So the noise level is going to determine if you need if random noise should be added to the target average. And this is a, a parameter that you can define. Um, here. I've also included a document on some target encoding best practices from H2O. So um, you do have some additional guidance here. But to talk more about like how H2O3 does the target encoding, um, first the target encoding map is created. And so that's gonna contain the sum of the response column and the count. And then you're going to apply a target encoding map and that's going to be applied to the data and then it's going to add the new columns with the newly created target encoding values. And because overfitting is a, a big concern when you use target encoding, as I mentioned just a few minutes ago, these are the three parameters that can help prevent that. And um, I won't go over them again, but you know, basically if you want to prevent overfitting, then you can use these, uh, these features, excuse me, parameters to uh, do so. Okay. Okay. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to quickly do a, um, a demo of target encoding in H203. So I'm going to, I'm using Python. So I have started up um, our aquarium environment, which is what, what the environment that you're going to use to do your hands-on learning. Um, so this is like a fully hosted by uh, H2O. Um, so we have, um, we have our um, H2O open source platform. We've got our sparkling water platform. We also have our um, driverless AI labs that you can use to, to learn. So right now we're gonna use the H2O3 uh, platform. And so what we're gonna do here is we're just gonna, I'm gonna show you how easy it is to create a model that to estimate whether or not your target encoded features are um, actually it actually improve the model. So just to quickly walk you through what is going on here, the first thing that we're going to do is um, we're going to import the H2O uh, library and we're going to start up our cluster using H2O init and then we're going to pull in the two um, the two models that we're going to use. So the H2O target encoder estimator is the target encoding model. And then we're going to use a, a GBM. So we're going to use a tree based model um, to evaluate whether or not our target encoding does make an improvement on the model. So you'll hear more about um, GBMs in uh, module three, but today we'll just, we're just going to focus on showing you how target encoding can improve um, a model. So I'm going to go ahead and um, start my cluster. 
So when you start your cluster, you're gonna see some information like this. So, you know, how long it's been up, it's age, the version, you know, how much memory you have, um, the version of Python that you're using. And this is helpful for information if you're, if you're um, encountering any types of issues. So just so you know, um, kind of the lay of, or, you know, what that is doing when it's starting up. Um, what I'm going to do here is import a, a data set. So I'm going to import this Titanic data set from um, our public S3 bucket. So we're going to use the import file um, function from H2O. And I can see the progress here. For um, Because we're doing a classification, so we're trying to predict whether or not the passenger survived, we have to let H2O know that we're doing a classification um, problem. So you would use as factor to note that you are um, doing classification. So I'm going to, you know, define my survived or my target feature um, or convert this to a factor and then create my response column, which I'll use later on when I do train my model. And then I'm going to split my, uh, my data into training and tests. So I'm going to give my test training data set 80% of the, of, the, um, of the observations. And then I'm going to set a seed for reproducibility. OK. And now what I'm going to do is decide which columns I'm going to encode. So I know that these are categorical columns. And so I'm going to use these as uh, the, the columns that I encode to see if they improve the model any. So I'm just going to def uh, define which columns I want to use. And now here I'm going to uh, set my target encoding parameters. So you may um, you may uh, remember that I, I said blended average is one of those that parameters that you might choose to help prevent overfitting. So I'm going to set that to true. And because I set that to true, I have to de define, I'm going to define some additional um, parameters. So inflection point here, um, that is, that is, um, is used when you, when you have to, um, when you set blending equal to true, and it's going to calculate uh, your lambda. The default value for this is 10, so you can definitely change this value. And I would encourage you, you know, if you if you don't know where to start, start with the default. And we do um, document that, but start with the default and see how your model changes it, as you change uh, some of these parameters. Um, and then the next one is smoothing. And so this is also used when you set blending to true. And Marios did talk about um, target encoding with smoothing um, uh, yesterday. So do absolutely check, or excuse me, on Tuesday in session one. So please do check that out. And then here I'm defining whether or not um, I need to add some additional noise. And so um, I, I want to say that the... I don't know what this defaults to. Oh, no, sorry. Um, the note here just says that, you know, if you have a small data set, then maybe you want to use more regularization. So again, this is one of those things where, you know, I would try a value and then, you know, maybe try a different one to see um, how my model changes. So right now we're just going to define those parameters. And here, I'm going to use a strategy for data leakage handling. So I'm going to select the K-fold strategy, which means I'm going to have a number of folds for, um, for cross-validation. So here I'm selecting K-fold as my data leakage handling um, strategy. Here I'm going to just call my fold column K-fold column. And then I'm going to use this K-fold column um, function from um, H2O to actually define, to create those folds. So I'm gonna do a five-fold cross-validation. And in the hands-on exercise, I do point a link to, uh, to this documentation. So if you have questions about that, then you'll be able to kind of do a little bit of research on that. Okay. And so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna train our, uh, we're gonna to begin to train our target encoded model. So I'm giving this a name and I'm using that um, target encoding model and I'm gonna pass in those parameters that I defined earlier. So I'm gonna pass in my fold, my data leakage handling, um, my blending 
and then my uh, inflection and smoothing parameters. I haven't trained my model yet. That's what I'm about to do in this, this section here. So here I'm training my target encoding model on the Titanic data set. And then I'm going to use, I'm going to train it on those columns that I, um, that I specified up here based off of my, uh, my response, which is whether or not they survived. And then I'm just going to use the training data set. So now I'm about to train my target encoding model. You see it was pretty fast. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to transform, I'm going to use that train model and I'm going to uh, do my transformation on my training and my test data set. And then, sorry, and then I'm going to also do um, create a GBM. So uh, just do a gradient boosted model and I'm going to use the target encoding um, features to see how my model performs. So right now all I'm doing is just defining a, a default GBM here. And so in this section, what I'm doing is I am specifying what are my uh, predictors. So if I look here, I see, um, you know, I've got the original features and now I've got my um, target encoded features for those that I selected earlier. And now I'm going to train my GBM using those, uh, using those, the set of features, and I'm going to predict whether or not they survived and I'm going to use the training data set. So now I'm building a GBM model. Okay. And now I want to see how does, how does my model perform on data that it hasn't seen yet. So that's why you have a test data set. Um, we did use cross validation. So uh, we, we just want to make sure that, you know, based off of the cross validation metrics um, and the training metrics that when I look at my test data set, that it's not um, overly optimistic so that, or that it didn't overfit. So what I'm going to do here is just pull the model performance using my test data set with the target encoded features. And I'm going to um, create this, I'm going to actually look at the AUC. And so I see here that, you know, about 87% of uh, the features I could, you know, predict. So this is pretty good. So now I want to see, uh, I need to know how what does that mean in terms of, you know, how the model would predict if I didn't do any target encoding? So what I'm going to do here is just, again, you know, set up a def default GBM that I'm going to call GBM baseline. And then I'm going to pass in my original features and train the baseline model on those original features to predict my survived column. And then I'm going to do the same thing before where I, um, I'm going to look at the model performance on the test data set. So this is the original test data set. And I'm going to look at the AUC. And I'm going to print out my AUC here for the baseline. So the fact that my target encoding, um, my target encoded GBM has a higher AUC means it does perform better. So like those target encoded features did provide some additional boost to my performance. Um, so the, uh, the question, there's a question about how to decide the features for target encoding. Um, you know, that, that's based off of, you know, a couple of things. So, you know, maybe your intuition, what you know, um, trial and error. Um, if you do, if you have categorical features, then yes, um, you can do target encoding and, um, you know, if you had 10 categorical features, you could do target encoding on all 10 of them, or you could only do it on a subset. Um, I, that's part of what, what the iterative part of feature engineering is for. So you don't know, you may not know how features may um, improve. So one strategy might be to do target encoding on a single feature and then see, you know, if that improves things and then, you know, iteratively go through your, your categorical features. Um, and then, um, and then, you know, see how each of them individually affects the performance. Sometimes if you try to do all of them at the same time, you don't really know which one might be providing the lift. So um, I would say, you know, it is a trial and error um, process, especially if you're using like an open source product. Um, let's see, does H203 open source do auto feature engineering? It does not. Um, so, 
that's that's one of the reasons why I'm showing you this process. So we do have some feature engineering capabilities, but um, if you're using like an open source tool, then you're going to do it iteratively. Maybe you can write, you know, some loops or uh, to be able to like automate a little bit, but no, it doesn't do automatic feature engineering. So that's the end of the demo for H203. So you'll get the chance to get this code and be able to uh, execute this uh, yourself. And I would encourage you to like try some other um, parameters for some of those, um, for some of those, uh, Try some other values of those parameters that, that I mentioned. All right, so now we're going to do um, just a quick introduction into driverless AI, the automated feature engineering capabilities in driverless AI. So, um, that's there. Oops. Um, so, driverless AI does do a lot of, uh, do a lot of the automation for, um, the data science workflow. So like data cleaning, feature selection, feature engineering, model selection, tuning, and ensembling. So um, I've linked here all of the different types of transformers that are like out of the box for, for driverless. And this is a really good place to go just to understand what are some of the transformers that you can do. So even if, even though like these are referenced in driverless AI, you could still use some of these techniques in like an open source platform. You just have to figure out how to do it. But there's a lot of really good descriptions of, um, you know, the transformers that are, um, that are like out of the box capabilities for driverless. And then there are some examples. So it, it, the documentation does kind of walk through like how some of these feet, uh, transformations um, are calculated. So it might make some, some additional sense to you. Um, but aside from like the transformations that are part of driverless natively, we also have this extensibility of driverless AI through bring your own recipes. Um, so this is where you can bring in custom code. So maybe you have like some sort of internal IP or maybe you just wanna try something that is not um, included in driverless. That's how you can bring that information into um, into our automated platform. So we've got several different types of recipes. So data, so those are kind of related to like data cleaning. Um, uh, then you've got transfer, uh, transformations, uh, which are like all of the feature transformations here. There are lots of them and I'm gonna show you the GitHub repo um, in a moment where you can, I mean, it, we do, Staying true to the whole democratizing access to AI, this has a lot of really good exam code examples of um, different types of recipes that can be used for any of these different um, categories. We have also got model recipes. So there are some uh, models that, you know, we don't have out of the box, but you can bring into driverless if you wanted to try them. And if you have your own custom model, you can bring that in as well. And then um, scores. So, you know, how you're going to evaluate your model. Um, those are all different ways to kind of use driverless outside of kind of what we've offered as the base package. All right. So now I'm going to do a demo of driverless. All right. So, uh, Again, you'll get a link to how to, you know, log into this here, but I'm just going to do a quick overview of what driverless AI is doing. So here I've started up driverless. I've got a ton of examples of data sets and, you know, experiments um, that are part of this, this lab. So we're just going to take a look at a, a, a quick look at a data set here. I'm going to look at this uh, credit card data set. So this is trying to, this data set is used to predict whether or not a customer is going to default on a credit card. Um, so this, this information was brought in. Um, what we're going to do is I'm just going to quickly show you the types of data that are in this data set. And then we're going to talk about um, how driverless does automated feature engineering. So here in this data set, we've got a, you know, a, a range of information. So we've got some information on the customer, like their credit limit, their gender, their education level, marriage, um, how old they are. Then we've got some information related to the status of um, their prior uh, payments. So whether or not they were late, whether or not they were on time, um, 
whether or not they paid in full. Um, here are like how much they were billed. So we, we do have some numerical information here and then how much they paid. So, you know, if there's a delta between how much they were billed and how much they were paid, then, you know, that might indicate that there might be some issues there. But here is our, our predict, uh, what we're trying to predict, default. So we're just trying to predict whether or not a customer is going to default. So we've got uh, some categorical features. We've got some numeric features in this data set. So um, aside from, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at the training data set. I'm gonna click on that. I'm gonna click on predict and I'll just exit that. And so what I'm gonna do here is driverless is like it. So I've, because I selected that card train data set, driverless is pulled some information about it. I'm going to select, um, I could select a, a test data set. I'll just select the card test data set. So that will do some additional evaluation on the test data set once the experiment is complete. But here I'll select my target column. And because I'm doing a simple classification, um, driverless is going to pick that up once I select my, um, my target. And so now based off of things like what, what are the types of data in my data set, what are the value types of values in my data set, um, what's my target, how big is my data, um, Driverless is going to do a, a series of, uh, make a series of decisions and then output a, a suggested set of settings. So, you know, if, even if you didn't know what was actually going on under the hood, if you were to import your data set and select your target, you'd still get a really pretty good model. So I just want to talk to you about um, kind of what's over here, because this is where we're going to talk about the feature engineering, what driverless is doing. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, um, you know, we've got these accuracy time and interpretability settings. And so any combination of some of these will adjust what type of feature engineering driverless will do. So just to talk a little bit um, about like the, this feature engineering space, like at these settings, based off of the type of data that I have, driverless will try to use things like cross-validated categorical to numerical encoding, cross-validated target encoding, um, looking at the original uh, looking at the original categories, doing some sort of cluster target encoding, looking at the frequency, the interactions, because we've got that those numeric uh, fields in our data set. Um, uh, it'll try some one hot encoding. Um, I can't remember. Uh, there apparently are some text data set uh, text fields in here, so it's going to try text data as well. So it's really smart in trying to figure out what are the best set of features, excuse me, feature engineering to try. So as I adjust um, my settings, so I'll just adjust interpretability here. So interpretability is, you know, how easily, easily can you explain the features? So if I adjust this up to 10, that means I get really simple feature engineering that happens. So here I'll do things like the frequency, I'll do a one hot encoding, maybe I'll use the original data, I'll do a simple cross-validated target encoding. Those are really easy to explain, um, or those are easier to explain. But if I were to, you know, drop this down to one, um, there might be some additional features that show up here. But one means basically try anything that you suggest um, it doesn't mean that they'll end up in the final model, but um, but it but it will at least be in the running. Um, so it looks like maybe we added truncated SVD for numerical features here when I move it down to one. So you know, depending on how I have these settings, driverless will make a series of decisions on what types of feature engineering I try. So there are a couple of ways to kind of control this, and you know, I'll show you here. But also in our expert settings, um, if you come here, you can look at what we call recipes. And so here you can, you know, include or exclude certain transformers or models or scorers. And so here I'm just going to uh, click uh, the transformers. And you can see here, like, there are a number of transformers. And these are all ones that kind of come out of um, the box with this this version. This is version 1.9. So we've got um, some NLP related transformers like BERT. Um, and then we've got all of these transformers. If you notice, like there's some lags, lag related transformers. Those didn't show up in my, um, 
my future engineering space. And that's because driverless determined that, you know, these transformers were not appropriate for my data set. Now, if I had like time related features, then these might show up in my data set. If I had um, some other text related features, then some of them might have shown up in my data set. So driverless really does, uh, driverless is smart enough to figure out which transformers make the most sense for your, your case without knowing, you know, exactly what, what it is you're doing outside of like what your classification task and what type of data you have. So you can select and deselect those transformers. Now I also mentioned that we've got um, our recipe GitHub that you can look at. So, you know, from driverless, I can click official recipes and I would, I'm taken into this um, GitHub repo and you'll have access to this link um, as part of your exercises as well. But what, what you can see here is like, this is a set of, let's see how many recipes do we have here? About 174 recipes that span, you know, from data to, to models, to transformations, to scores. So there's a ton of other examples that are not like part of the, the out of the box uh, driverless capabilities. So, uh, you can come here and get some inspiration. So I'll just look at transformers since that's what we're talking about here. So if I click on the transformers, um, the transformers uh, folder, we spent a lot of effort is put into creating very useful feature engineering techniques because that is probably out, uh, that's probably one of the most important um, aspects of modeling, aside from like having a really good data set. Um, and it's probably more important than the model itself that you use. So there are lots of different examples. So um, some of them are organized by like time series or, you know, speech or NLP. There's some image related ones. And then there's some others like, um, like date time. Um, outliers. So like there's a lot of information here. Um, I'll just like open up this numeric one. So for numeric features, there are some additional transformers. So like maybe instead of doing like addition, multiplication, subtraction, and uh, division, maybe I want to do a log of the features. Or um, so I could bring this into driverless and have it be included in the potential list of feature transformations that driverless will try. Now it doesn't mean that it'll end up in the model, but you know, it's, it's a, um, it has a chance. So I just want to quickly uh, kick one of these off so you can see what driverless is doing um, as it's creating an experiment. So I'm just going to set it on the fastest settings and click launch experiment. So what's going to happen is like once you click launch experiment, driverless is going to do a couple of checks to look for things like ID columns. Um, maybe if you have an imbalanced data set or if you um, if you've got shift like a data shift or data leakage, potential data leakage in your data set. Uh, like all of those things will happen and then it'll start doing some tuning and then it will eventually start creating a combination of models and feature engineering. So what, what I want you to do is pay attention to what's happening kind of right here in this variable importance section, because that's where you'll start to see, you know, some of the types of uh, feature engineering that kind of show up. So are the features mostly original or are, you know, some of the features that are show up in the top, are they uh, engineered features? And as you know, driverless kind of goes through the model and feature engineering iteration, you'll start to see, you know, maybe some features stay in the top as you know the iterations continue. So that means like it's it's a, a feature that um, that survives to the next model, and eventually you'll get a, a set of features that show up in your final model as well. Okay, so. All right, so you see here, all of these are actually original features that are showing up here. And I know that because I don't have like a, a suffix here, I mean, a prefix here that kind of tells me what type of feature engineering that it's doing. I probably should have decreased the, um, decreased the, oh, but I can hover over these, um, I can hover over each one of these little boxes here, which is a new, which is a new model and feature engineering um, 
feature engineering uh, combination. If you can see here in the middle, like I do see like a single um, cross-validated target encoded feature. Um, if you decrease interpretability, you'll see more complicated features. But as you kind of hover over these, you do see, you know, which features are staying in the top, which ones are kind of, which ones are new, how important are they? So like, as time kind of goes on, you, you can see some interesting things kind of happening in your data. Um, let's see, is there anything else? Um, you know, I, I, well, the model is almost complete, but you know, it does look like most of the features that are going to be in the top here are going to be in uh, the original features. But I do encourage you as part of, you know, this this session and you know the the exercises to come back and try um, to use driverless to get a sense of kind of how driverless is working when it comes to feature engineering. I wouldn't worry too much about what models it's using because we'll talk about that in future sessions. But um, take a look at this and take a look at you know some of the recipes that are on GitHub and definitely try um, to use the open source in a driverless. I mean, excuse me, the open source version. And um, hopefully that'll get you started. So um, and then the last few minutes, I'm just going to kind of summarize what I've done or what we've talked about today. And so basically, we know that the goal of feature engineering is to improve a model's predictions. And so we talked today about like um, one of one of the feature engineering techniques that shows up a lot especially if you look at driverless and kind of do some of those experiments over and over and over again, which is target encoding. And so for H203, if you wanted to do target encoding, you absolutely could using that target encoded uh, model. Um, just to reiterate, feature engineering is iterative. And so if you're doing it manually, it can become very time consuming, um, but it is very powerful. And just to reiterate that driverless does automate lots of the aspects of you know that iteration and it can be really nice if you've got a really big data set to see what kinds of features are created using um, driverless very quickly just a note that the recording for this session will be posted within you know two days um, our next session is on tuesday um, the 22nd and we're going to start with uh, looking at supervised learning in h203 your quizzes are will be presented, you know, within two days as well. And, you know, use the study group and the ask me anything, especially as we continue to kind of go through this material. And as we start to build on our knowledge as we go along, um, leverage those sessions. And just to point out the resources, here is um, some information on how to or, you know, the place to go to create an aquarium account. I do encourage you to um, create one so that you can come back and learn without having to kind of worry about like, you know, how you install certain um, aspects of the product. Uh, it is made very easy for you. And in your hands-on exercise, I'll, you'll be walked through how to create an account if you don't have one. It is free for you. So take advantage of it. And then we'll include some um, additional resources. So because we can't do everything in these sessions, we'll try and give you some additional resources to kind of get you started. So here we've got some information on, you know, some data manipulation, some Python, especially for uh, scikit-learn, which will be very helpful for some of those encoding examples that I talked about earlier. Um, and then we've also got some information on uh, feature engineering. So with driverless AI, um, I would say, you know, if you want to get some inspiration on how to do some things, maybe in, in an open source environment, definitely take a look at some of those transformation recipes and see if you can't find a way to do some of this in maybe H203. Um, and then, you know, just some other um, some other resources that we've we've got that talked about that talk about feature engineering in different ways. So as the course goes along, you'll continue to have resources to put in your toolbox. So hopefully Hopefully this was helpful for today and you know I can pause here for any last questions if there are any okay well it doesn't look like that like there are any questions so I will end this session and thank you so much for joining and hope to see you next week have a good one